Welcome to Global Perspectives. What holds the world together in tumultuous times? Some say it's luck. Others say it's strategic connections. For insights, we turn to Catherine Brown, President and CEO of Global Ties US. Global Perspectives with Pulitzer Prize winning commentator, John Bercia. Welcome to the show, Catherine. Thank you so much for having me, John. Absolutely. So, tumultuous times. Maybe we should step back a little bit and talk about times that were maybe somewhat less tumultuous when you were getting involved in the field of international affairs. Was this something that started when you were young? Did it come as you evolved in your life and career? Or what were the inspirations for you to go into this field? I grew up in Los Altos, California, which is uh, right between Palo Alto and Mountain View, so between Stanford and Google today. Um, of course, it wasn't like that when I was growing up. Um, but my, my family um, was pretty international. My parents actually met on an airplane. My father was an aerospace engineer. My mother was a flight attendant. They flew internationally all their lives and felt it was really important for us as their kids. I am of two sisters that, that we do the same. So a lot of foreign travel growing up and then coupled with my father's really intense interest in politics. And I think that just influenced me to really become um, more interested in, in studying international politics um, as I got into high school. What was your first international experience that you remember in a way because it had a significant impact or something like that? Well, the one I remember the most vividly um, was I was 10 years old and we went to Japan. And I just remember never feeling so foreign <laughs> um, in my whole life. But, but I think that the experience that influenced me the most was when I was 16, I went and became an exchange student in Denmark on my own um, without my family and realized how not only completely out of my depth I was, you know, individually, but also how little I knew about my country and um, how much, how illuminating it was to, to see the United States from um, 3,000 miles away. And so that was the most transformative, I think, foreign experience that I had. It was my own um, exchange student experience. And you were there for a year? I was actually there for one semester. One semester, but that's, that's yeah. a good bit of time. It was a good chunk of time for being 16, yeah. Wow. And then after that, you obviously studied the subject in college from different perspectives. Yes. I, I kept um, going abroad. Um, I went to Mexico the next summer um, with a wonderful organization called Amigos de las Americas that brings American students to South America for community service projects. Um, and then I studied abroad in Northern Ireland, which is close to where my family is originally from. And I studied international affairs. I eventually um, transferred to college from University of Colorado at Boulder to George Washington University and started getting more immersed into the foreign policy work environment in DC, um, which I was extremely lucky to be able to do at a young age um, and was able to intern for Senator Dianne Feinstein and um, at the State Department and then eventually at the National Security Council um, during the last year of the Clinton administration. For those who aren't familiar with where GW is, yes. it's in a <laughs> uniquely important and useful location when it comes to studying foreign affairs. Yes, it's right in downtown Washington, D.C. It's about a 10-minute walk from the State Department, about a 10-minute walk from the White House. So it's positioned very well for students who, who want to build a, a career in politics or in policy. So you started working with members of Congress. Mm -hmm. And was that something you had intended to be your long-term career, or was that just a stopping point? I think it was just me testing it out. Um, I wanted to see what the, the political view of, of foreign policy was and essentially the legislative process um, when it came to national security. So, so I, I worked there on and off um, as an intern. I later went back in my career on the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Um, but it was important to me um, to get a variety of perspectives into how foreign policy is conceived and, um, and um, executed. So I wanted that Hill perspective, and I also wanted the executive perspective as well, and eventually the, the NGO and the, the private perspective. Talk to us about how you piece together your career. Historically, people would join an organization or two and stay for a long period of time, and today that's just not the norm, uh, partly because organizations change, mm -hmm. uh, economies change, and so forth. But help us understand why it's just as valuable to have short experiences at a number of places as it is to work for long periods of time at, uh, at companies or organizations. 
Yeah, it's something that I talk to a lot about with my students who are um, beginning their careers in, in international affairs. I think it's really important to, um, on two different levels. First of all, um, there's just the, the practicum dimension of it. It's, it's you challenging yourself and not becoming too complacent in one environment and making sure that you stay on your toes and you acquire new skills and also that you identify how those skills can be transferable. Um, so I think that's that's important, but also just to get that perspective and to um, to ensure that you're not being too siloed in the way that you view policy, because it's very easy. Washington is a especially it's a very tribal place, so it's very easy to become like a State Department person or um, you know a Hill person or a private sector person, and not really have respect or empathy for the other points of view, which can sometimes come in a conflict and, and be counterproductive. So. So I think it's important from those two perspectives, for one's own professional development, but also for the larger strategic goals of, of um, U.S. foreign policy. When I think about tumultuous places around the world, one of the first ones that comes to mind is Afghanistan, and mm -hmm. you chose to go there, uh, which is not what most people would do, uh, given the, the, the conflicts and, and so forth going on. But w what drew you to Afghanistan? Uh, so. When I first went to Afghanistan, it was 2003, and um, I was working at the National Security Council as an assistant to Condoleezza Rice and, and Steve Hadley, or National Security Advisors. And the, the focus um, at the time was on Iraq. And Afghanistan was a country where I, I was very drawn to because it was so clear that um, the way that the foreign policy there was framed was that it was not just an issue of national security, but also an issue of humanitarianism and development. And it was a, I, I wasn't so comfortable with the war in Iraq, but I did really deeply believe in the work we were doing in Afghanistan back then. So when uh, Zalmi Khalilzad became the U.S. ambassador there, he was at the NSC and offered me an opportunity to go, and it just felt right because at the time, I was looking at um, foreign policy from an incredible view. It was, I had a seat in the West Wing of the White House to watch the decision-making process, but I was intensely interested in, um, in seeing how then that played out actually in the field and what was the effect of these decisions that were made by a very small group of people. And so I was um, really, it was almost immediate that I said I would go um, and and once I got to Afghanistan, I became intent really ad attached to the place. Um, if you talk to a lot of Americans, and there have been thousands, um, and there's, there's you know, hundreds in Washington alone who have served in Afghanistan the last 17 years or so, they'll tell you that there's something that is, is in inexplicably just emotional, emotional about their time that they've spent there, that they really feel drawn to the Afghan people and to you know, to their struggle um, for a life of peace. And so, so it's something that um, was important to me in the beginning, but then um, once I got there, it kept me coming back year after year. And so I was in and out of there for about 13 years. Afghanistan at the same time, even though it is compelling for people, and apparently so people for people in many cultures, and, and it's been called the graveyard of empires mm -hmm. and, and on and on and on, what is it that seems to ultimately defeat the empire that tries to uh, sort of manage or, or, or bring peace to Afghanistan? Well, the thing, I think what, what has happened to the United States um, the last 17 years is that you've heard this, um, this phrase that, that we fought you know, a series of one-year wars 16 times. And that it hasn't been, you know, a 16-year war. It hasn't been. Um, we haven't continuously fought it. And I think that there's something about the way that our own bureaucratic structures are set up um, to to have such a revolving door of diplomats and development workers and soldiers coming in and out of there. And Afghanistan is an incredibly complex place, and you can't really understand it. I don't pretend to really understand it um, after being there for so long. You can't just by going in and out. Uh, you have to spend time there. You have to get to know the place. 
and its legacies and how that has formed Afghan identity, which isn't necessarily uniform. Every district is its own universe in Afghanistan. So what works in one part of the country, you know, will not in another. Uh, so, so understanding it takes a lot of time and we don't work on those cycles. We have two-year political cycles in this country. So we want fast success. There was no declaration of victory in Afghanistan the way there was with Iraq, but there was essentially an acceptance, especially by the press and by the public, that Afghanistan was a quick success, that everything there was going fine uh, in, in the early years. And so I think there's a lot of misunderstanding and, and that there's a reason why we're still there after so many years, but also there's an incredibly adroit and wonderful group of, of Afghan citizens who are working very hard to ensure that their country is peaceful and prosperous and is on its way um, towards a democratic system that works for them. And so I'm, I'm supportive of our continued engagement there for that reason. Did you have any close calls while you were there? And generally, did you feel safe? I felt safe. There was never, I, there was never anything in particular that, uh, never any kind of attack that I was a part of. And I know that's a lot of luck because definitely uh, my friends who, who weren't so lucky. Uh, so I felt safe that in 2003, 2004, the embassy was fairly open. The ambassador was Afghan American. So he absorbed more risk, I think, than maybe other chiefs of missions and wanted to get out into the country as much as possible, and that was my job to facilitate that travel and and those events. Uh, so I got to see a lot of the country in the early years. Later when I went back, I really just confined myself to Kabul because I was doing some independent research. But the, when I did go back in 2016, the city looked starkly different from 2013, which had been the last time I was there. And the Western presence in the country had adopted much more of a green zone mentality, which was a, a phrase that was applied to Iraq and to Baghdad, uh, a secure part of the city where Western embassies and contractors could be. We never had that term in Kabul. Uh, it, was, it felt different. It felt safer um, for, for many years. And so now that that bunker mentality had come to the country, that, that felt different and made me feel more anxious than I had ever felt before being there. The embassy, the American embassy, is about a mile away from the airport, and yet our civilians now uh, cannot travel by road. So you hear helicopters around the clock of just moving our diplomats and, and aid workers just within the city or to the airport. So, so that that sound, coupled with the sights of the the walls, it made me made the city unrecognizable for me. So after your last visit there, was that when you decided to write the book, or was the book something that had been in your mind for some time? Well, the book is, is, an, is an outgrowth of my dissertation. So I, I studied, uh, I was at Columbia Journalism School for my PhD, and what I kept looking at other topics to write about, and my professor said, you need to write about what you know, and you need to add some unique value uh, to the field of communications. And so your, your comfort level with going to Afghanistan uh, you know, will add some value if, if you decide to do your field work there. So I started doing my field work in 2010 and I decided to focus on the, the storytelling about the war, the storytelling about the country from both the American perspective and the Afghan perspective. So I wanted to look at how the narrative that is built for American audiences, which is inherently nationalistic and, and uh, looking out for the American public's interests, how that is then received in the country uh, by, by Afghan officials and reporters. And simultaneously, not only this quasi-diplomatic role that American or US foreign correspondents play, but also this developmental role they play to the Afghan journalists because they had never had a history of an independent, independent press before. So the sustained presence of, of Western correspondents in the country dramatically affect their professional development. So there's a complicated relationship then with the Afghan journalists. On one hand, they're grateful for this, this mentorship of, of the American journalists. Um, on the other hand, 
they, they can be resentful of the coverage that they're reading about their country from these same journalists. So I wanted to explore that more. Uh, and, and so between 2010 and 2013, I did my PhD work. And then I finished my dissertation, sat on it for a long time as I did other things, and decided in 2016 to revisit it and, and refresh the book uh, for a book, refresh the research for a book, and go back to Kabul uh, uh, one last time for the book. Help us understand how difficult it is to ensure that concepts like democracy and pluralism and practices such as freedom of the, the media, how, how difficult it is to get those to take in a country that doesn't have a tradition of, of such practices. Well, I think the Afghanistan case is, is unique in the sense that they had dealt with a extreme form of authoritarianism under the Taliban rule. So there was no media. There was there was the Taliban run media or, you know, state run media that was incredibly strict, stricter than you would see in other authoritarian societies. So there was a little bit of a history where they had a a press that was run by communist parties or political parties. And so there was some familiarity with television and entertainment, especially in the nineteen seventies and eighties. Uh, with the the Afghan the Afghans knew kind of what entertainment looked like and what uh, what a press generally looked like, that was taken, and then they we were very eager to return to it. So the fact that with the Taliban there was no music, right? There was no imagery. There was no television. There was a very receptive audience for some kind of music, entertainment, culture, and information that they they had been starved of for years. So immediately there was this demand for, for a news media and a young population that was very eager to fill that demand. The, the first radio station in, um, in Afghanistan was funded, or the first independent radio station um, was funded by, by the U.S. Agency for National Development. They gave seed money to a media entrepreneur named Saad Mohseni and his family who were Afghans who had gone to Australia uh, um, they had been, been raised there during the, the Soviet rule of the country, and they came back and started investing in the media infrastructure for the country. And I think that, to your question, I think that the news media really did create that spark to to encourage other freedoms and other and to encourage civil the development of civil society and to in, encourage the development of of a liberal democracy. So the fact that there was a press and that there were young Afghans who were eager to be journalists. To um, to be on television, to 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 push back against conservative norms, and to to confront taboo subjects, that was revolutionary uh, for Afghans. And that some some people say that they moved a little too fast, and so there's been a lot of backlash against the press. They've they've worked at what feels sometimes like a breakneck speed by putting women on television and confronting um, issues about family violence. Or, or you know, other things that have, were previously, you know, off limits. But but it really has been the vehicle in which I think a lot of uh, other freedoms have have come into play. So freedom of speech has been an incredibly important dimension of Afghanistan's development, and was something that was championed by Hamid Karzai, but then really institutionalized by President Ghani most recently. The idea that the messenger is often someone who should be punished is very common in, in human society mm -hmm. and we see it happening in frightening numbers around the world journalists representing various media are always getting hurt sometimes killed we saw this recently in, in Afghanistan w what is the incentive for someone to go into that line of work if you know that there's going to be that sort of response in certain places I, I think journalists are, are wired a little differently than others, I'm, I'm convinced, and, and they are truth seekers. Uh, they, they want to be there to write the story. They want to be there to write, shape the narrative of what people you know, will see and how they will understand the events that take place. The, they're naturally very committed people to, to storytelling and, and to truth seeking. And so I think for the Afghan journalists in particular, this is their opportunity 
to contribute to their society in a way that they could not in um, in past governments for the country. They, it's it's a culture that respects great you know age and seniority and and their elders, and so they're normally you'd have to wait your turn to to be a a leader in the country and I think journalism gave them an avenue to pursue justice and to pursue truth and and to pick up where they feel like their institutions maybe were failing and, and this was their opportunity to contribute to Afghanistan's growth and so that is what I know for the Afghan journalists what they told me drove them to the profession. As we look at the journalism function as one of the strategic connectors uh, between societies today. Um, wh what is the benefit that it brings to the people in the country they're covering and to the people in the country that they're from? And then maybe you could talk more broadly about international professional exchanges. Mm -hmm. that, that's sort of an exchange, not, mm -hmm. I mean, it's a profession uh, mm -hmm. as well, but, but it, it serves a similar function. What I look at in particular is, again, how, how the narratives of one nation is received by another. And what I found is that there is this inherent implicit bias that comes out in the way that articles are framed, um, depending on who you're writing for, and that it can be hurtful you know, for another audience to, to receive that. So the, the tendency of, of the American press to speak of the world as if the United States is the hegemon, is, is, or at least one of the, the global powers that has responsibility for the stability and development of the rest of the world, and that the rest of the world is in need of saving, or is in need of assistance, or in need of, of tr American troops. That can be, that can sting. That can be very hurtful, and the, it can create a lot of suspicion around the world. So, so narratives are important for giving us meaning and constructing meaning, but I feel that if there's going to be a transformation in one's, in one's worldview, and if there's going to be some empathy that is created, and for one to really, to really understand the narratives that, that they're, they're absorbing and to look at it from multi-perspectives, multi then there needs to be that interpersonal dimension. And that's where exchanges come in. And that's why I love my job so much, is because it's intensely focused on ensuring that there are relationships uh, so that the conversation is long-term and not just focused on the news cycle. Uh, so, so that is why exchanges are so crucially important, is that you're, you're more likely to be open-minded to the information you're receiving if you know you know, the, the environment in which that narrative is created and the sociological circumstances for why it was created that way. You may not have just one answer to this question, but is there another country or region that compels your interest the way Afghanistan did that you would like to spend time in one day? I, I would love to spend more time in, in, Asia, in Asia. I mean, Afghanistan is South Asia, but I'd love to spend more time in Northeast and Southeast Asia. I think that the youth populations, especially in Indonesia and Malaysia, Philippines, are 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 changing um, society and commerce at a rapid pace. And so I'm very driven towards um, towards spending more time in that part of the world. But also, I I've spent very little time in South America and Sub-Saharan Africa. And so uh, I think that there is when you're talking, especially about the way that the United States um, news agencies have traditionally framed the world, I think that we've gotten Africa wrong. <laughs> so I think that there's a lot of more, there's a lot more good stories to be told there and a lot more richness that, uh, that, that I'm not getting from, from, our, from our press. So I would like to go there and, and understand it better. One of um, the, the hallmark programs of the past administration, uh, the last administration was the the Young African Leaders Initiative uh, that the Obama administration started, which really was trying to capitalize on, on the, the talent, the overwhelming talent that is in Africa and give them these exchange opportunities to come to the United States for professional development. So, so that really 
sparked my interest uh, when I was seeing how successful that program was. And so I'd like to spend more time there in South America for the same reason. I'm always curious, what do you read to stay informed beyond the usual briefs and news media? Do you have any special sources that you find useful? Well, my diet is uh, normally NPR, Morning Edition, All Things Considered, and um, the New York Times Daily podcast. And I'll read the uh, Mike Allen's Axios aggregator and, and political playbook, these things in Washington that get the city on the same page every day. And, and read the New York Times and read The Economist, I, I'm reminded that I maybe need to rethink my sources and, and to look for more conservative ones. Um, to add to my news diet, so uh, so it's a good it's a good reminder that we can't become too reliant that we have to challenge ourselves to look at narratives from from different perspectives. You talked about the challenge of growing democracy and pluralism in Afghanistan and some of the other issues around the world. Is there another issue area that it's maybe not specific to to one country that is of special concern to you? There isn't like a specific region in the world that I'm most concerned about. I am, but I am worried about the increasing distrust in the news and in the journalism profession and the increasing reliance on disinformation and misinformation for short-term political wins. Thank you for joining us today, Catherine Brown. Thank you so much. And thank you. For Global Perspectives, I'm John Bercia. We'll see you next time.